Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If If you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John o. White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Bill Miller. I'm going to get Bill to tell us in a moment about his book, uh, which has won a couple of awards. And uh, Bill is an advisor, a consultant um, to CEOs and uh, and a coach as well. Welcome to the podcast, Bill. Oh, thank you very much, Jono. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to have you on and to chat with you. First of all, tell our listeners about your book and a little bit more about what you do. 
Absolutely. So as uh, as John mentioned, I I am an author, published author of the book The Rookie CEO. You can't make this stuff up. It was published in October of 2020 and recognized as one of the top six books for beginner CEOs. So in uh, July of last year. So that's pretty good. And uh, I'm also an advisor and consultant to CEOs of small, medium businesses and vice presidents who work for those CEOs who want a little bit of guidance and help on how to get around challenges. So that's kind of what I do these days. And uh, I love everything that I do. Uh, Love technology. I'm primarily in the technology space and have been at the senior level of startups, three startups from early days to 40 plus billion dollar multinational companies. So I've been uh, senior level at all these different levels of companies and can play the politics and although I don't love it (laughs) uh, and I just enjoy helping people. That's what I do today. Just love it. Wonderful. Well, yeah, thank you for that overview. Uh, Let's jump into your story. I'd love to start by looking back at your childhood, Bill, and and when you were growing up, as you look at that season of your life, are there any moments that that come to mind that really shaped you to become the leader and the person you are today? Absolutely. Well, like a lot of people, I think um, my father is probably my biggest influence when I was younger. My father was a small business owner. He had a beer, wine, and grocery store that was uh, was his father's, and uh, and I worked for my father from the time I was probably about seven or eight <laughs> until I was a young adult. And one of the things my father taught me was when you're, uh, when you work hard and you run your business with empathy for your customers, uh, it will pay off in the long run and you will succeed. Now, how, how did he do that in a small business like that? Uh, he, you know, he worked 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week which is interesting. But, you know, in the old days, in World War, my father was a World War II veteran in the U.S. Army. And one of the things that he did learn was uh, people can't always afford everything on any given day, but they need things like milk or in those days back <laughs> when I was younger, cigarettes or whatever it was that they needed. M- my father would extend credit unofficial credit. There was no credit cards back then. Uh, He would just write it on a piece of paper, clip it, put it on the shelves behind the register, and people would come in and pay him when they had the money, when they get their check, whether it was a Social Security check or a work paycheck. And the thing that was interesting is he never let anybody starve. He always helped everybody. And so he showed me the hard work and the empathy really created loyal customer base. So when you think of that as a foundation, it's pretty amazing to me. Uh, Never even thought of what customer service was until way later in my career. But that's kind of what he was. He was amazing when it came to customer service. So, and then the other thing growing up, I uh, I played a lot of sports. My life is built around, from when I was a kid, built around sports. And, uh, you know, in the U.S. here, we're crazy about our professional teams. And since I come from the Boston area, I'm a fan of all the Boston teams. But I, but when I was a kid, I played baseball, Little League. And one of the things that I think was fortunate for me is I was on teams that were winless, go through a whole summer without winning a game. And I was on teams that were undefeated and never lost. And I... I had some great coaches that really taught me uh, how to win and how to lose gracefully without really losing your cool. And those really prepared me for later on in my life because life is full of ups and downs, as we all know. Those types of things really helped me. And those are the moments probably that stick out the most to me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Bill. I'm interested to hear a bit more about your dad. Are there any... Are there any moments that come to mind? You mentioned how he treated people and wouldn't let people starve with uh, with the business that he ran. Um, are there any moments that come to mind where you saw him deal with a situation or it's just stuck in your memory, the way that he handled something in the business or in life that, that really inspired you? 
So, so as I said, when I was a little kid, I used to go to work with my father. He had to drive in to the markets to buy all the wholesale stuff, and he had a pickup truck, but with a, a back on it, you know, like a, because of the lousy winters in the Boston, New England area, uh, he had a cover on the back of the of his truck. And I used to go with him, and he used. I learned how he built relationships with all of his suppliers. <laughs> so he used to go in and he'd get the best meat. He, you know, he was a butcher as well, right? So he'd get the best meat. He'd get the lowest prices. He just, I just watched him negotiate with these people, and you know, he he would meet them and have a cup of coffee, and it just watching my father in action was. You know, because he wasn't this smooth CEO kind of guy that runs a big company. He was a small business owner that had to feed his family. It was four of us, my sister and I, you know, mother and my father. He had to feed us. And, you know, we weren't wealthy by any means, even though he was a small business owner. But he was a very good negotiator, very good schmoozer. And it was just those styles that I think uh, watching him and remembering all of those moments which still crossed my, my mind on occasion. Uh, those are the things that stick out. So it, mm. it was a lot of great qualities that my father brought to the table. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing about that. Uh, so as we fast forward, I always love asking about the first leadership opportunity, or sometimes there's a couple that, that come to mind. It might've been in sport. It might've been when you were little. It might've been when you were a bit older in, in a first job, but do you remember the first chance you really had to manage people, run a project or, or, or lead something? Yeah, so uh, let me just say that I love this question and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, for people who decide to go and check out my book, The Rookie CEO, uh, in, in the book, I create a framework for, uh, for leadership and the four elements of the framework are the path that somebody takes to become the CEO, the philosophies that they bring to the table, the leadership styles that they've developed, that they run the company with, and those together build the culture, create the culture that that company is going to have. And until I wrote my book and actually came up with that framework, nobody's ever looked at it this way. Even though you'll read lots of stuff, there's tons of stuff on leadership books. I know you read a lot of Patrick Lencioni and stuff. They all have their own perspectives and they come up with, you know, the servant leaderships and, you know, those those models that everybody uses. But my framework is a little bit different and it can help people who have not become a CEO yet, but they're thinking about it. So it also applies to all your positions, the path to CEO or all those positions and the leadership positions like that you had on the way up. And that's your question to me. So my first leadership position was unexpected. And I was working for a very large company in Southern California at the time. It was an aerospace company, but the commercial division of it, uh, a $40 billion global company or, you know, U.S. company, actually. And I became a director of a group, an off-site skunk works. And it was a replacement for somebody that the company was firing. And so that was my first leadership role. And it was really kind of interesting how it happened. But all of a sudden, I have, from being just an individual contributor, I became the director of this team, the Skunk Works team that was developing new technology. And I, I kind of knew all the 16 people that were on this team. It was 16 people in an admin. And I, I didn't even know where to start, but I, you know, I just, everything I had observed and read up until then became my, kind of like my guidebook. Up until then I had been an engineer because I have a degree in engineering, computer engineering. But I had, you know, I wrote software for many, many years. I was a product manager. I was a marketing manager. I was a product planning manager. But this was the first leadership position with multiple people. And, and believe me, every manager makes mistakes. Every CEO makes mistakes. And so I made my first mistake probably the first weekend I was in the job 
But I did that because I looked in everybody's personnel file to see where they came from and what they did. That was like a stupid mistake. But I sent Christmas cards to everybody and they said, how did you know my home address? And you see how that was like not right? So I, you just learn by doing stupid things and then you never make the same mistake again. But that was my first true leadership <laughs> position. Uh, mm. That was the that was a really important one on my path to my executive level positions over the years. And the the second example, which I think yeah. is another good one, is I joined a company, a software company, open source software company, and they were a leader in their market. But the CEO and founder was under thirty, and I was not under thirty. But I became the first. VP of the company and the first adult <laughs> in the company. And what I found is this company was profitable in a bizarre way, but they had no infrastructure. They had no process. And that was one of the things that I learned that really helped me uh, help other companies and other rookie CEOs. They just had no process. They had you, and you had to start small, right? You have engineering development team that didn't have a product development process. <laughs> so you had to give them a one pager first before you actually went into a true product development process to deliver quality products. So those are kind of some of the examples of just, wow. and you just work with everybody. You sit down with the young guys, you sit down with the people that have been around the company for a few years, understand who's connected to who because you never know when you walk through the doors if somebody's a cousin or a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law or in a couple of cases spouses <laughs> which was interesting so those those are a couple of really <laughs> interesting examples of uh mm. of my leadership roles <laughs> yeah in those first couple of roles what were the biggest lessons you learned that have stuck with you all these years well, obviously, the first one is don't don't take the personal information out of their out of their personnel files. You, you want to know what their backgrounds are, but and that is important. I'll tell you what happened in that very first job when I replaced the guy that that the company fired. This is a huge lesson that I've learned, and I actually teach it when I when I coach or advise CEOs today. This guy I replaced had built the team and he had the wrong people in the wrong job. He, it was bizarre. He had somebody writing code that had never written a line of code, didn't know what to do. So the guy hated coming into work every day. He had another guy that he hired to run customer service, but he was a coder. So one of the first things I did as I talked to these 16 people is I rearranged the whole the whole skunk works within just a few weeks and put everybody in a role that they were suited for and that they were more interested in doing. And boy, that team just went, they, they really exploded and, and they delivered the product that they were developing faster. Everybody was happier and uh, it, it was kind of interesting. So when you inherit a team, any any manager or leader who manages a team really needs to understand who's on the team, what are their goals, how do you match the company goals with their goals, and can you move them around into a position that's better for them and the company? I think that's a critical uh, learning experience that has stayed mm. with me for, it's it's well over 30 years now for that role. So, wow. And then the second one, which was in all the kids, the second one that I had mentioned when I was the first adult, when I walked through the door, a couple of people said, oh, my God, we're going to have to work harder now. We got we have a real VP here. <laughs> and I sat down with this guy. He was a director of customer service. And I said, why do you think that? <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't in the door 24 hours and he was saying things like that. I said, you know, don't spread rumors until you understand who I am and what I'm doing. You know what I mean? It's just you, you got to. You have to tell mm. people, you know, let's let's get to know each other. Let's go through yeah. all the projects. Let's see who's doing what. And then we'll take it from there. Just a couple of experiences when you first <laughs> inherit a team. Yeah. Uh, what What's your advice to leaders who inherit a team and 
maybe something's not sitting right about someone on the team in terms of their role or uh, them j- just generally whether they're competent or whether they have the character to do uh, the role. What's your advice if a leader walks into a situation like that about about how to navigate it? Great question, Jono. The, the first thing is, like I said, you have to meet one-on-one with everybody. I think one-on-ones become a critical element all the way through management. But when you first inherit a team, you have to sit down and meet everybody and find out who they are, what are what's their scope. And the first thing I look for is attitude. You know, do they have a chip in their shoulder? Uh, and I'll give you an example of why I say that in a minute. Uh, find out what drives these people, what motivates them. And one of the things in my book, you know, that I really talk about is motivation. And I will, I will share a story, my favorite story, which is about a wheelbarrow. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, and that's about motivation and understanding as a, as a leader, what motivates, you know, different business functions. But at, at the end of the day, sometimes you're going to run into people that have an attitude problem. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was hired at one particular company uh, as a vice president of a, of a business unit. It was not large, but it was U.S. only. And the very first day, this guy walks into my office and he stands in my door. This is how he met me. And he said, I want to raise. And I should have had this job, not you. (laughs) So that, (laughs) that is a true story that, you know, I've, I've shared that with a lot of people over the years that I've coached, or advised, or led, and said, you know, don't ask for a raise until you, you know, can validate why you deserve it. But I understand you. I was hired over you, so let's understand what do you do, how do you do it, why did they skip over you, and I found out why after spending some time with this guy. But obviously, I had to move him to the top of the queue to find out what it was, but this guy had a chip in his shoulder. You know, he had more degrees than I had. Uh, He was very smart, but book smart doesn't make you a good leader. And so he he was leading uh, a team, a small team of people. But he was not qualified, not only to get that VP job, he wasn't qualified to lead that team. And it did take me a few months, but I did move him out. Eventually, yeah. because that's, you know, he had, that's it, yeah, is an attitude. That's crazy. It, yeah, but it's but that's what happened. That kind of stuff does happen. <laughs> so you couldn't make that up, could you? That's just no. That's no. got to be the worst <laughs> possible way to introduce yourself to your new boss. How to? <laughs> that's how to lose friends and and uh, <laughs> uh, you know the opposite of influence, whatever it is. That's I, not how I to know. influence people. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> So as you reflect on your career, Bill, I'm interested to know if if there are any aha moments you can share with us where other sort of turning points where the penny dropped, where something comes to mind where you watched someone else lead or you had something happen yourself as a leader that has really stuck with you, you learned a lesson that you'll never forget or any, any aha moments as a leader that come to mind? Oh, boy. Aha moments. Oh man. Well, I've, I've used a couple already. (laughs) Um, all right. So this is a great place that I can insert my wheelbarrow story. This is an aha moment. Um, Yeah. I was in a startup in Silicon Valley and the CEO, rookie CEO, who in the book is the deal maker because he was a former sales vice president of a very sizable multi-billion dollar company before he became the CEO of our startup. And I was vice president of marketing and product management. And we had launched the company and the products at back-to-back trade shows. We did it two separate ways because there was technology, core technology, and then there were the products. So there's the company and the core technology, and then there was the products a month later. And when we got back from the second conference trade show, we were notified by the development team that we were going to be delayed six to nine months because there were chips involved and they had to do a respin. 
So the CEO said, look, Bill, here's what I want to do. I want to get a wheelbarrow, put $100,000 in the wheelbarrow, roll it into the conference room with all the engineers. There's about a dozen engineers there and say, this $100,000 is yours if you can deliver on this date. So we don't have to go back to the beta customers that were already signed up and resell the account, you know, resell the products to these people. So I said, not a good idea <laughs> because number one, most of these engineers are already multimillionaires. So a hundred thousand dollars isn't going to, you know, tickle their fancy. And I don't think the founders are going to like that, but he decided to move forward with this. And there was a meeting with myself, the CEO, and the two co-founders who were the, the chief strategy officer and vice president of engineering. Uh, I'm sorry, CTO and vice president of engineering. That's what they were doing at the time. And they were the techies. They, they, it was their idea, their technology, former Sun executives, very successful. And they just looked at each other. They looked at each other for about 10 long seconds. And then they looked back. I can still see this as clear as day. And then they looked back at the deal maker, who had just said this. And they said, you don't trust us. You don't believe us. And that aha moment. Now, I was right in suggesting that he didn't do this. But in that aha moment, it was, you got to understand as a rookie CEO or any CEO first time that different groups have, are driven and motivated by different things. That was a huge, it, it's such a basic fact that people don't think about when they become the boss. And uh, engineering is motivated by solving problems, hard problems, and coming up with the you know, really creative technical solution. They're not driven by $100,000 in cash. Who cares? Like I said, these guys were living in multi-million dollar homes in Silicon Valley. They, they, don't, they don't care about this money. And it caused all kinds of other problems. The whole story is in the book. But that was a huge aha moment to me. I'll give you a second one um, from one of the yeah. CEOs, also written in my book. It's when you are a new leader, in this case, it was a CEO, and I was running a small business unit at this company, and the the boss comes in and she, and she hands me a CD from her former company, and she says, "I want you to go into the CD, download all the files, and I want you to go through them and change the blank 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 confidential to our company confidential." And these are going to become all of our new standard processes and product development processes. And and I just I just looked at her and said, "What? <laughs> I mean, talk about how to lose integrity on on the first week on the job, and in your first meeting. It was my first one on one with the new CEO, and she's telling me to change proprietary and confidential information." and change their entire document. I mean, this thing when printed out was volumes of information. Why would we replace it? We were, a, you know, we were a three, $400 million division. And she, you know, it just didn't make any sense. So the concept of integrity and obviously trust goes along with that. Uh, day one that I met with her at a one-on-one, -on -one, it was completely destroyed. And, uh, you know, it, it wow. that kind of stuff, you start sharing that with the with the leadership team. Now, I only told one peer, but it, it didn't take long for that to travel because I was over there changing the documents and then distributing them. And uh, number one, it was against it was against my better judgment. But she was my new boss. So what did I ha You know, I had no choice at the time. So. Now I did leave that company eventually because she drove. You know, I I just could I couldn't work for that. But those are two yeah. really huge aha moments. 
yeah, no, they're, they're great aha moments. I appreciate you um, sharing those. Um, so, <laughs> wow, that's that's intense. Uh, what about great <laughs> mentors? Who are some of the people along the way who have been mentors to you or leaders you've worked with or watched from afar and admired? Okay. Well, the work, work from afar and admired, of course, uh, you can put me on the Steve Jobs list because I, I was impressed with Steve. Uh, even though I knew quite a bit about how he ran his company at my Silicon Valley startup there, we had a few people that came from Apple. And so I knew, I knew that he was quite ruthless inside. Uh, but I really admired him. He was a great leader. Um, the, the other one that actually is more recent is Satya at Microsoft. He has taken a company that size and turned the whole place around. It's very impressive. Uh, my personal, my personal favorite is yeah. um, many, many years ago when I was, it was early in my career, uh, I was an engineer and I had done a technical proposal for uh, the oil and gas group, vertical market group at a company. And the vice president of, uh, of the vertical sales group uh, and I went on a trip to the Middle East for 10 days where he did the commercial side of the proposal when I did the technical side of the proposal. And one thing I learned from him is how to win big deals. He had orchestrated everything about every meeting. He knew who was going to say what from the customer and when, how he was going to respond to that. He had all of his negotiate, negotiation points laid out. He told me when I was going to talk and when I was not going to talk because, you know, I was an engineer. They didn't trust all the engineers from the sales side. Uh, but I built a great relationship with them, and I learned from this guy about mindset and preparation. And so the best salespeople I've ever worked with know everything about their client, all the players, who's going to say what, who's going to do what, and that was the learning from from this guy his name is dick and uh, he's since wow. retired i know that but he was a great mentor for me uh and i did go to work in his group i i kind of broke a, a rule in that particular company they never moved people from engineering to sales in that company i was the first one that they did that to and it was an old 75 year old company but it was uh, it was a great experience and he's he sticks out in my mind yeah. Um, t so help me understand a bit more about how he did those deals. So what sort of deals are we talking about? Um, that that's because I think there'd be a lot of leaders leaning into that going, Oh, that's, a, that is a valuable skill because that's, in, if you can, if you can understand how to do that, what you just described, how to really create and run a great communication around it, around a deal that, that the people on the other side go, wow, this is great value and, and feel, uh, feel very warm towards you and feel like there's a great value in what you're putting putting uh, you know together for them that that's a game changer for for anyone in in business so tell us a bit more about how he did that excuse me sure so so one of the things that that I learned when I first got put on this team that was going to work on the proposal so matrix corporation and so people from different groups would be assigned to a project team and this was a sales project. And so Dick would call uh, a kickoff meeting and there was a project manager involved from a different group and there were actions and names by every action, which is a typical project management. This is way before Microsoft project time. So <laughs> this was all done manually really back in these days. But the one thing that Dick, Dick did was he in all of the early meetings with the customer where we got put onto the RFQ process, because we're responding now to a request for proposal, RFP. And he, he broke this large project down into small pieces. But one of the things he did that I've rarely seen since then even, is that at that customer, which was a sizable oil refinery, he knew who was responsible for what part of that proposal from the customer side. 
So who is responsible for the technical aspects of the oil, you know, the refinery process? Who is responsible for the IT, the information technology side? Who is responsible for the reporting side? You know, all the reports that are going to be given to managers and executives. And there were probably 30 or 40 major players on this multi-million dollar deal. And this is this is back in the 80s. So it gives you an idea that, you know, there were some pretty large deals. But it can be today, those, you know, the size of that deal is not unusual. But the fact that he knew and prepared for who and every phone call and then when when just he and I actually went to the Middle East location and then there was a local rep who came with us and the three of us yeah we hung out with the customers because we were there for 10 working days but the fact is that everything was orchestrated nothing no stone was left unturned if they do this then we do that. If they if they come back and say this, then we go down this path. And it was a flow chart that really left no stone unturned. And so to me, it was about mindset that he was going to win this deal. And then two, preparation, where nothing was going to stop him and he would be prepared for every aspect. Uh, I really see that in the you know since then even in large deals at most of the companies that I worked for I was I was always the sales marketing product management side um, but I wasn't ever the sales vice president if you will so I never owned that portion of it I owned part of it so I tried to repeat what what Dick did for me and for the company back then that I was with um, but I didn't own the whole process. He owned the whole, the whole deal, and I was one of his key team members, and I knew when to say nothing. In fact, he even called out, "Look, they're going to walk out of the room when we get to this point. <laughs> they're going to stand up and excuse themselves and say, "We need an hour." He called that back at the home office. <laughs> he said, "This is what's going to happen. They're not going to like this. Wow, but they're going to going to come back." And this is where we have elasticity. But but think about all the elements that go into that. So that's, uh, you want to be a successful incredible. leader? You got to understand all of those little details. That is a, uh, a an incredible ability to read people. And uh, that's, that's astounding. Um, what about Steve Jobs? You had people who came from working with him. Were there any stories <laughs> that you heard, partly or, or completely true, but anything anything you heard about how he led that really struck you as particularly genius? Oh, man. Well, you know, I'll forget the public stuff. There was only one story that I remember. Uh, the guy who was running our uh, hardware design technology, who is involved in the uh, Lisa development? Uh, he told us at the startup that Steve didn't really understand a lot of that, the the design elements, and so he Steve had to learn how to decide who to trust and who is right and who is wrong. And he said if he if he thought somebody was pulling the wool over his eyes, then he would potentially fire that person right there on the spot. So uh, you, there was that, and there was the secretive aspects of that particular company. That's probably one of the most secretive companies in the world uh, mm. when it comes to uh, different groups within the company can't talk to each other. That started early on, and... Uh, one of the companies that I was a VP in the last several years, Apple was a customer, and uh, I can vouch for the fact that uh, they only people working on a certain project can know about it. <laughs> Not everybody can learn about what's going on because they're too high, 
you know, high visibility mm. and too competitive. So, but that story, yes. he, he, he gave us that story. He watched a couple of people get fired back then. And that's a long time ago. So mm. it was 20 years ago that I was at that particular startup and that wow. particular individual who had worked for Scott McNeely at Sun and also uh, for Steve. So I got to hear a couple <laughs> of those stories. Pretty interesting uh, stories. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite books of all time is the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. I I just love it. It's one of the books that had me laughing out loud just at the, the <laughs> different stories about how, uh, yeah, how he led and, and definitely not perfect. And there's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, advise everything he did, but I think you can, we can learn a lot from him. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's great. Well, let's jump into Leadership Express, Bill. I've got a few questions to ask you are you ready sure go ahead okay so the first question is uh i'm interested to know is what's a book that you've gifted to other people and you can remind us again about your book but then maybe give us another one as well because i know normally the book when you've written a book you know as an author often (laughs) your own book is the book that you'll say hey this this might help but yeah so tell us again about your book and then what's another book that you've gifted to other people okay so uh, my book is The Rookie CEO. You can't make this stuff up. And it's, it's an anomaly, but I worked for nine first-time CEOs in a row. And I know that's hard to believe, and it's kind of the luck of the draw. And when I decided to write the book, it was after that first aha moment that I told, well, the second aha moment that I told you about. But um, it's... It's designed to be both entertaining and educational. Uh, It's not a big book. It's a short, kind of a short read. But the fact is, uh, I build the the framework around it to learn how to, you know, the type of leader that someone will become. So that's my book. And I do give that away and I sign it, you know, when I go to do a a CEO insight panel at, at a trade show. It'll be the second time in June. And I sign my book for people that, hang out after the panel. So I do give that away. But over the years, uh, I think I mentioned my product management and marketing background that I had mostly. Um, the two books that I've given to my team uh, over the years, my Bible is Crossing the Chasm, Jeffrey Moore. Uh, I've owned all three editions of his book. Uh, the first edition i I kind of broke the hardcover spine. Uh, the, sec- the second, you know, the last one that I bought, the third edition, was the paperback. So it didn't matter if I broke the spine or not. Uh, but I've given that book to my team, and it's helped a lot of people in go to market. Uh, yeah, that's that um, that's that's great. So that's a book that you found most helpful in marketing. That is in product management, probably more and than product management. Okay. Both. Yeah, both yeah. of those groups. Crossing the, the chasm. One, yeah, that is my favorite. That is my favorite of all time, by the way. And then yeah. my second favorite was Guerrilla Marketing by J. Conrad Levinson. Uh, so that's another book that um, I've given to my entire team because I wanted to do everything I could without just blowing money. It's yeah. easy to spend money in marketing and product management. Uh, I wanted people to learn guerrilla marketing. So... That's another book that gives good ideas that in brainstorming you can build around. So those are the Love two it. books that I've that I've done. Yeah, that's great, Bill. Uh, okay, next question. Right now, are you in the middle of any books? Are you listening to any podcasts? Are there any blogs or anything else that you're loving, uh, watching, reading, or listening to at the moment? Well, to be truthful, I've been listening to your uh, your podcasts, and they're I th- I love the the conversational style, oh, and uh, several of the people. So, and I've connect. Well, it's very good. So, uh, that's one. So, my quest for the best with Bill Ringel is one that it's a yep. small business, uh, small business leader, uh, top fifty on uh, Apple Podcasts. So I like that one. He has excellent guests, uh, and I like John Lee Dumas, who's has a. A podcast called Entrepreneurs on Fire. It's hard to keep up with him because he does something every day. So I can't keep up with him 100%. Uh, 
uh, but they're excellent. Um, as far as blogs, I read tons of blogs, but I write my own called CEO Insights, and uh, it's on a media property that um, when I uh, when I give you my link tree, I'll give you people the link to that blog. It's everything CEO. It's really it's really quite well read and followed around the world, so it's pretty good. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Please do please do share that. Uh, next question. What is a great piece of advice you've received at any point in your life? It doesn't have to be about leadership even. Uh, that I've received. Okay, I have one favorite. The best ideas can come from anywhere and anybody. That's Yeah, that's that's that, good. <laughs> Just because somebody may not be on your senior leadership team or they may not be an advisor or a consultant, whatever, you're a junior engineer might have the best idea that your company has ever seen to improve or build a product. It just it just can just come from anywhere. Do you have any favorite quotes? Uh, once again, it doesn't have to be about leadership, could just be about life in general, but any any quotes that you find yourself uh, repeating or just are very close to your heart? Well, of course, you can't make this stuff up is <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, I have a mantra that I use uh, that it's always easy for the person who doesn't have to do it. And uh, I do mention that in the book. Um, but that is something that is very true. There's a lot of these CEOs, especially rookies who've never done this stuff before. Uh, they think it's easy to run marketing or they think it's easy to run finance. or they think it's easy to do, you know, add a couple of lines of code to do something, but it's not. It, it's a whole project. It, it's a lot of elements. And so these people, a lot of these rookies bark orders and uh, I understand they're the boss and everybody hangs on every word they say. Um, but they really should uh, talk to brainstorm with their team and the the, the top-notch leaders that they hire and, you know, that they hopefully trust. And uh, before you just park orders, I think that's a, you know, it's not always easy. Believe me, it's usually the opposite. Yeah, so, yeah I just absolutely. wrote a blog. To, I just wrote a, I do Friday CEO tips on LinkedIn. Last week I did. Yep. There is there is no easy button. <laughs> there is no easy button. Sorry. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> that's right. Um, no, it's uh, it's so it's so true, isn't it? And uh, what about any favorite questions when you're sitting down with a CEO, when you're coaching someone, when you're with a team? Do you have any favorite questions you like to ask people? Well, so yeah, I mean. One of the things that I always ask them is, do they have a system and a process to track uh, track the goals? And I, you know, and and a lot of times they don't. Um, I I personally use and coach uh, on 30, 60, 90 day goal planning, and I try to use smart goals. And uh, one of the one of the things I write about in the book is it doesn't matter what kind of goals you use. You know, there's key performance indicators, there's, you know, all kinds of different methods people use. But you got to have something that tracks the elements of what, you know, the deliverables of all the functions and key people. And then you cascade those down to the different teams. Uh, the 30, 60, 90 has worked for me. Uh, over the years because it allows me to look at a quarter, you know, and then the 30 days, and then there's, you know, I use a spreadsheet format for this actually, but um, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> so the first question that I will ask is about the goals, and then the second question is what keeps you up at night? And then I get to really the hot areas that they're stuck in. And yeah, you know, that's great. They're 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 always something, and if and <laughs> if any any CEO or even leader manager if tells you I have no problems, there's nothing, there's no way you can help me. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> then I'll, I'll keep asking things. You know, I, I took a Xerox 101 uh, sales class way, way, way back. And uh, I wasn't in sales, but I worked with sales. So I, I took that. And one of my favorite questions that they taught me was, oh? <laughs> if somebody says something, you look at them and you say, oh? And they continue to talk. You know, you just say, oh, until they finish what they were going to say. And so that's worked over the years. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty incredible yeah. how well that works. No, that's but a good I, one. I like that. It's a good verbal yeah. cue to help people continue. So there are all kinds of different methods, but that's one of them. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, last question, Bill. This has been this has been uh, great. It's been wonderful to to hear your thoughts. Last question: If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Oh boy, there's so many. <laughs> um, I would probably say, be self aware. Uh, people listen to everything you say watch everything you do and you you have especially today where there's a lot of meetings are on video uh you got to be careful having a side conversation you got to be careful what you say in the chat but you just be self-aware of everything because you are the head honcho and everybody cares what you say and and you might be thinking out loud but you know, they they might think it's that they should stop everything and go do that. And that's Yeah, that's so good. So you have to just be self aware of everything around you. So good, Bill. Well, for those who have really enjoyed today and want to connect with you and, and find your book, can you remind us again where people can find you? So all of my key uh links are on my link tree. And I, I think most people are starting to learn what Linktree is. It's uh, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Beeline Bill spelled out. So that's B-E-E-L-I-N-E-B-I-L-L. So, in fact, if you just do a Google search on Beeline Bill, you'll probably find that's my my Twitter and my LinkedIn and my Facebook. And <laughs> my website is BeelineBill.com, but it's the Linktree is it will have the connections to my book, which is available in all formats, audiobook, hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Um, and it'll take you to my website. It'll take you to my CEO Insights blog and all my social channels. And please reach out and connect to me. It'd be great. Yeah. Wonderful, Bill. Well, uh, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in to today and make sure you go and check out uh, Beeline Bill and look up Bill's uh, book as well, The Rookie CEO. Um, and, you know, don't forget for our listeners, I also have the John O. White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, two, uh, two other places where you can invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to Bill. Uh, thank you for being so generous with your time, for sharing great stories from your career so far and some really wonderful leadership principles. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Bill. Well, thanks for having me, John. I really appreciate it and really enjoyed it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. 
I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O'White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.